Part 2 of 5, Biodiversity Lecture. So why would I propose to you that biodiversity, or as we say, saving space, uh, spaces, because biodiversity exists, the life exists in the space, there's no other place where it can live. It certainly can't live in, in I mean, there is some biodiversity in, in software stadiums for sure, but it's probably not that much, so we have to provide spaces to it. One of the main arguments I think nowadays being discussed is economic. If we lose biodiversity, we're losing money. That's normally, politicians pay a lot of attention to that and, and, and economists as well. Here's a few facts that we probably don't see every day. 40% of today's global economic output is directly related to biodiversity. Food, medicine, all those things. If you add them all together, it's 40%. But of course, um, we will see it later on, it's not only 4%, but for those poorer countries and for people in, in poverty, biodiversity is proportionally more important than for us. So if we lose biodiversity, it's not only going to be a loss of money, but it's going to be a loss of money for those people that don't have much, much else. 25% of the pharmaceutical industry today is still directly linked to plants or animals or sponges or, or, or other kinds of organisms without considering those what we call derivatives, which are things that were made or, or substances that were created on the basis of organic molecules from, from living beings and then perfected to be the cure of any other uh, disease that we may have or condition that we may have. And of course, the problem here is that more and more we're losing the diversity of food. Uh, nowadays, you can see from here, something like 23 species out of the, and you, as I said, there's 5 million described species, but there are people saying that there's 15 million living species. So what it says is that out of those 15 million species, we're actually keeping only 23. So we're not taking good advantage of all the possibilities. And what's more, when we lose the diversity of species, in Peru, for instance, for every little piece of, of rainforest or, or mountain forest that disappears in Peru, maybe a variety of potato is being lost that could be resistant to a problem that we have in the coming years. In 1850, Ireland had a problem with famine, with, with, with uh, food, where millions of people literally died because there was a fungus blight on the potato. All of a sudden, all the potatoes died out in the whole island. They didn't have any alternative. They just started. And, and basically, it could be that uh, the, the cure for that blight or the potato that is resistant to that particular kind of fungus exists naturally in Peru. And then you cut it off there, it's lost. So this is basically the uh, economic argument. Today, we discuss a lot about ecosystem services, meaning, well, the living beings, those beautiful wetlands that, that are the object of some of the activities that, that you have here, and we'll talk about that later on, uh, that provides services. So maybe the critters are not that important to us directly, and maybe if they die out, well, that's not too terrible for us, but what they provide us with, clean water, clean air, uh, all those services, for instance, it's known in, in, in the developing world, and certainly in Canada as well, that the land that surrounds a protected area normally is more fertile than the land far away from it, because one of the consequences of, of all that biodiversity is that the, the, the nutrients in the soil are better protected, and therefore our productivity, agricultural productivity, is also a service that comes from ecosystems. So I'm, I'm talking here about uh, water, I'm talking about uh, soil fertility, temperature. In the cities, for instance, green areas are in general five, five to seven degrees colder in the, in the, in the, in the summer and warmer in, in the winter than concreted areas. So th those are all services that are given to us from biodiversity. This is very much related to quality of life. I mean, all of us, when, when you look around, and, and this is maybe, um, it, it could be kind of the egotistical reason to say biodiversity or to be concerned about biodiversity, is because we live better when we have biodiversity. Personally, I don't know about you guys, but personally, when I have a very hard day and I can walk through a park at the end of the day and just look, and, and you're so blessed here because you have it right in front of you, but just this sight does good to my soul. And I know that when, when you want to think or when you, those are all services that come from that and that increase our quality of life. So it's also a question of quality of life. Particularly, I should say, there's another thing that's happening nowadays that most people in the planet last year lived 
in cities, so people don't live outside of cities anymore. Uh, in general, and that's the whole world. That's not only Canada or Brazil, but it's the whole world that as of 2007, more than 50% of people lived far away from biodiversity. But they didn't see the animals. They don't, less and less we see what that means. So we lose touch with it and we may forget all the things that come with it. Because even if you're in a big city like New York or, or Montreal or anything like that, Every service that you get here depends on biodiversity. You cannot eat cattle, you cannot drink water. Uh, it, it's much more expensive to drink water treated chemically so you can drink it. But if you let it just go through the watershed and be purified through the watershed, the Catskills uh, example of New York is well known, where they proved that the, you know, at the end of the day that it was much, much cheaper to keep the Catskills as a watershed and allow the water to be filtered through it than to install a treatment plant that would do the same service. So th these are things related to quality of life. Here is some other considerations that we can say. Uh, of course, uh, the remaining forest cover, Canada, is, even though it's, it's, uh, it's um, a developed country, of course, it has a significant forest cover. It's a very important country in the world of forests. But only a few of those countries have co forest cover. And, it's, and of course, uh, you know, it's, it's very much disappearing. I talked about biodiversity hotspots. That means the places where most species can exist. And for those of you who haven't done that yet, I would recommend to understand biodiversity, just go to a rainforest if you can, once, at least once in your life, make yourself that, that promise to yourself. Be once in a real rainforest in the middle of Gabon or in the middle of Brazil or in the middle of a real rainforest. If you want to be comfortable, go to Costa Rica. All you could for is nice, nice hotels close to biodiversity. But the experience of being in a place where you cannot name any of the species around you and where every square centimeter on, on, on land has probably 60 or 70 species that you've never heard of before. A good part of it was that never been described is something impressive. For me, I love it when, when you go into a rainforest and it's, it's all green and the light filters through and there's this river and you feel like in a cathedral. It's a unique feel. This is all because I'm trying to tell you it's not all about money. It's not all about quality of life. It's also about ourselves. Same thing happens in a coral reef. That's the second place you cannot not go or experience in your life. Try to look at a coral reef when it's alive and well, and you will see what we mean by diversity. It's, it's incredible. The experiences in form, the experiences in color, the experiences in communication that these animals try to, to do and the plants with one another. So the, the third point there is what, what I was telling you before, that poor people depend more on biodiversity than we do. I lived in the Philippines once in a little island called Palawan. And it's uh, people in Palawan, this was one of the poorest places in one of the poorest countries in the world. People in Palawan, they, when they live close to the traditional way, nature is everything to them. It's the source of food, fishing or hunting or, or harvesting or even planting in little agricultural plots, you know, that's food. But also when they need furniture, do you think they go to Ikea? No. They go into the forest, they cut a few things, and they do whatever they need to do. When they need cooking utensils, they do it in the forest. When they need medicine, they do it in the forest. So for them, biodiversity is much more concrete than for somebody who can go to uh, Intermarché and buy whatever you want. There is no Intermarché in, in, in those places. Dependence on uh, economics, we talked about that. But look at this last point, chocolate. You think, wow, chocolate is a way to give, you know, when you, when you buy um, fair trade chocolate at your poor chocolate uh, farmer in wherever it is, Ecuador or whatever uh, place, you, you feel a connection to that person. But remember that the price that you're paying, less than 5% of that price, actually, even in the best of cases, even in the, in the case of fair trade, less than 5% of that price actually goes to the person who is keeping the cocoa plant alive. So there are those things that we have to consider as well and that we should uh, this is what's being discussed in the convention when they talk about access and benefit sharing. It's basically rich countries saying, we will want access to biodiversity, and poor countries saying, yes, but if you're going to come in and get them, you have to share with me the benefits of what you're getting out of it. Biodiversity lecture, end of part two of five, continued.